We've got to take account of a changed world. It is a changed media landscape. There's no doubt that the internet has changed the game here. It's happened incredibly quickly. We have to remember that you know, young people are on the internet now before they're in the playground. I uploaded a video that happened to go viral in Sweden and then, hey, I've got a thousand new followers. I have to make something out of this. It is a turning point for media companies because it brings drastic change to business model and the role that one single organization can have on global societies. Social media in particular, but the internet more broadly, has taken editorial control away from these people and put it into the hands of the people you follow on Twitter, friends you have on Facebook. And that's a profound change for the, for the media environment. So social media platforms are doing a lot of the work that leaders of mobilizations of the past um, used to do. In my view, the internet is, is a new battlefield for, for um, uh, freedom. People simply should not be killed. Violence is unacceptable for the views they hold or images they were drawing. Do I put my trust in government or do I put my trust in technology? In this time of fake news, professional media companies should be making sure that their news are properly investigated, fair and impartial. That is the way to win the audience. We were promised a marketplace of ideas. We've been given a kind of coliseum of fact where competing worldviews that are both supported by all the evidence come into conflict with one another and they, there's no resolution there. So it's just an argument. We stand on the brink of the fourth industrial revolution. And just like the previous ones, it's completely changing the way that we live, work, and relate to each other. 70% of online Americans are on Facebook, 30% are on Instagram. Over half of uh, people between the ages of 18 to 34 in the UK are on Snapchat. Um, people spend growing amounts of time um, on social media platforms. All it takes is a mobile phone. You can be a journalist, a reporter, a pornographer. You can, be a, you can produce content and media and, uh, and it goes directly onto the internet. The internet has opened up a whole ream of new options as to where one can get their news. The possibilities of 7 billion people connected by mobile devices with unprecedented processing power, access to information and empowerment for self-expression are unlimited. And in many ways that's, that's a wonderful thing. It means that it, it's opened up our ability to see uh, things that otherwise we would never have been able to. It allows us to document practices and people who otherwise we would never have the opportunity to. But the internet is also exposing more. Uh, it's also exposing more corruption and crime in our society. Yes, right now we have so many different ways of creating and distributing content. But we all need to remember that pretty soon all 7 billion of us will be connected. And we are brought together to tackle economical and political crises, environmental threats, inequalities, and even the future of humans as a species. It's all very empowering. Our behavior hasn't really changed in centuries. The difference right now is that it is enabled by accessible technology, meaning that virtually anyone in the world can share and tell a compelling story and reach thousands of people instantly. I want to work with media, and that's why I think I started blogging in the first place, that I wanted to write and I wanted to express myself and I wanted to just use my voice. But media companies can amplify the effect through a clear vision and by consistently bringing it to life. Whether through a short YouTube clip or a drama series, we need to raise important social questions and tell meaningful stories that make us relate to each other. When it comes to internet entertainment, like the, the stuff I do, and when it comes to TV entertainment, those are two very different things. Social media and the internet allows you to both give it to you straight, you can, there is no sense of filter, everything is very raw. You hear it directly from, from, from a source, for instance, if we're talking about social media. But also the method of delivery, the style of delivery is, is, is very different. We are hearing things no longer from journalists, but perhaps from people who we trust or parts of communities that we already agree with. Social influencers are great at identifying which platform speaks with different audience, and then they create the content that fits the purpose. On my channel, I speak about things that I think of, or uh, struggles I've had, or 
whatever and people can relate to it because I'm like one of them. Gone are the days of one-way communication. Today is all about creating a collaborative environment with a sense of community and belonging. When it comes to TV or Netflix or other services, um, it's always a, a monologue. Like it's the, the big company and then they produce something and people watch it. But today, you don't need to be a media company to tell a compelling story that has an impact on people's lives. YouTube is more of a dialogue. And I think that's the main difference. I listen to my followers and I ask them, what do you want to see? And then I make that. Like in 10 seconds after uploading, I already have comments on what they thought about it. And I learn from that. So I think YouTube is more of a dialogue. And that is something that I've experienced that major TV companies, they don't really think about that when they, for example, hire me to do TV for younger people because they know that I know what they want, but they don't understand how our relationship works, really. It's a strange connection you have, but I also think that is one of the most important things, to build a strong base of followers and to also letting them know that they they can trust me. The biggest challenge now for media companies is how to engage with the Generation Z. Uh, the Gen Z are 7 to 20 years old and just for the sake of example they correspond to 25% of the US population uh, right now. And they are the first generation that actually is uh, digital and technology dependent. Gen Z's are defined by having a sense of purpose and wanting to work for the greater good. They care a lot about who transmits the news um, and they trust much more the inner circle of friends uh, than any media large corporation. They want to consume their news without any filter. They want to see live events unfolding in real time. Media companies cannot ignore their need to be part of the conversation. I really think that internet has become a way to um, make people aware of things and spread awareness and kind of wake people up. A lot of people in Sweden are feminists. LGBTQIA rights have really become an important issue and everybody supports them. And like the environment uh, issues. I think the fact that people are so aware and even younger people like 10 year olds are aware of the struggles we have with the environment, for example. I think it's because of the internet and that we can spread our opinions and we can watch TED talks about things that people have thought of and have ideas about. And I think it's, I think it's wonderful. The collective movements of the past tended to have leaders, either charismatic leaders or well-organized leaders, backed up by organizations which coordinated people, communicated to people, ideas, and more logistical things like letting people know when there were events and things like that, and made people, by gathering crowds around them or whatever, made people see that something was important and was getting popular, some kind of mobilization or campaign. So mobilization based on social media can challenge authoritarian regimes and, and has and even toppled authoritarian regimes and in liberal democracies can result in campaign for policy campaigns for policy change being successful. And that's something new in politics, this idea that you don't actually need um, leaders to get something going. There were widespread uh, demonstrations in Brazil um, in the summer of 2014 and the then president Dilma Rousseff came and, and said she wanted to talk to the leaders and she was told there are no leaders, you, you, there's no one for you to talk to. Social media act as a kind of driver of political change and the reason they do that is that they allow very small acts of political participation following somebody, tweeting something, viewing something, um, sharing something and so on. They lower the entry costs of politics and remember that once something has scaled up in an online environment it can have um, it can present a very human face in an offline environment if you 
think of the march of millions in Egypt or um, the demonstrations in Brazil or Hong Kong. There can't be a single country in the world that hasn't seen some kind of mass mobilization on the streets that was organized on social media. Most mobilizations fail and get nowhere and a few are really radically, dramatically um, successful and, and um, attract the attention of millions of people. All of them carrying out very small acts of participation which are scaling up to something really significant. The internet uh, has pro produces more information, more news, if we're going to call it that, than, than we can possibly uh, consume or, or, or understand in any, in, in any kind of way as, as, as human beings. Now how on earth do we start to process all of this data, all of this information, all of these stories, these hot takes, these comment pieces, these um, facts, counterfacts, arguments, counterarguments, whatever it might be. Um, we need some system. There is huge criticisms of the BBC, for instance, or other media uh, organisations in the UK because they were too slow in updating their, their, their content and that they're, somehow they're hiding something or they're lying. All of these details are flying around on social media. Why on earth has the BBC not reported any of this? The answer is obviously because the BBC is, making, is trying to make sure it gets it right. For mainstream media, what they report has to be accurate. Now the same doesn't apply for social media. The pace of reporting is, is, is what's, what's key. And that starts to raise questions of trust. People are, start questioning, why is mainstream media not telling me this detail? Or why is it not telling me this detail? Or why, is it, why did it wait five hours before it passed on this particular part of the story or this particular interview? Just like before, it's each media outlet's responsibility to provide a truly full picture to their followers. And at the same time, it's our own responsibility to make sure that we make use of all sources available to make sense of different viewpoints. When we hear news from communities and from people who we already agree with, who, people who we trust, who aren't necessarily journalists who aren't necessarily abiding by any kind of uh, journalistic standards, then that can be a problem. Post-truth, uh, fake news, um, it's definitely something that we see all over uh, media. Um, we hear discussions about this uh, like it never existed before. A post-truth society is one where objective facts are less important or influential in shaping people's opinions than what appeals to emotions or personal beliefs. And fake news is the hallmark of this post-truth era. There have always been lies. Everyone's always been lying. Uh, and, and, and so in, in many ways, this idea of post-truth or fake news is, 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 is nothing new. Um, fake news or false news, um, um, lies, I would say, uh, misinformation, uh, including propaganda, existed uh, before. Why are we discussing this now? Um, there is a big question mark and I don't think I can answer that. That it is financially viable and even profitable to lie to people on the internet is a fundamentally new uh, development. And if there is something to post truth, I think it's in there. It's dangerous to say that with a mobile phone in everybody's hand, then everybody is equal. Everyone is a journalist, everyone, everyone does what they want. And the danger is that that's not quite how it works because the economic model of the internet will prioritize some people's voices over others. And it is profoundly unequal in how it deals with that. If you want your content to whiz to the top of the Google search result or the YouTube search result or the Facebook newsfeed algorithm or the Twitter algorithm, it has to play by the rules. It has to play by whatever algorithmic rules have been set out for it. And usually what that means is that it needs to be liked, shared, clicked, commented, upvoted, and all the rest of it. And the question is, well, what, what kind of content does that encourage and what kind of content does it exclude? Does it exclude the, you know, the hour-long debate that, uh, that is nuanced and balanced because no one's got time for that anymore? And does it perhaps promote content that is visceral and shocking and sensational and perhaps as a result not balanced. Balance is essential. Media companies play an even greater role in telling stories that matter in the greater scale of things.
our audience, they also want to be heard and they want to feel empowered that they can actually make a change and have an impact on the democratic process. The UN Human Rights Council adopted uh, two years ago uh, stated that human rights are the same offline and online. In some countries, internet is the only uh, place for a dissent, for uh, critical voices, because there, are, there is no media, there is no pluralism. Currently, there are different debates, uh, particularly uh, on the international level, on how internet can be protected, how freedom can be protected. But at the same time, there are also discussions on how to control content, uh, how to make sure that uh, um, certain views are stopped for certain countries because of tradition, culture. This is not something we want um, as democracies. Uh, this is not something that should be example for countries that are striving to become democracies. And in a way, democratic countries, they should be leading by example, which currently, unfortunately, is not the case. And this is another danger I see, because those laws uh, that are introduced by democratic countries in the name of security, if they do not respect human rights in full, are used as an excuse for um, authoritarian regimes, uh, for um, governments that are everything but democratic, in order to continue suppressing critical voices, deferring voices in their society by using surveillance, um, and uh, other restrictions that are introduced in those laws. These kind of laws are used by totalitarian, uh, are used by totalitarian regimes in order to um, uh, suppress uh, critical uh, voices in their societies even more. Leaders of not really free world uh, telling me what do you want from us when you have this kind of law in um, EU member states or in democratic countries. Uh, I said on many occasions that it seems to me that security is becoming our biggest threat when it comes to uh, respect of human rights and particularly uh, free speech and, and free media. Um, it is very much related to protection of sources uh, in digital age, confidentiality of sources uh, for journalists. We need to be very vocal, very loud and very direct in defending our basic rights. In my work in the past seven years, um, I um, met many journalists that were actually moving away from journalism because companies were not really protecting um, the best ones. I think that the responsibility when it comes to media companies is in a way twofold. On one side, they have their responsibility towards the audience but if we are discussing content. But I also see the responsibility of media com companies towards their staff, towards journalists um, that are working for those companies. In so many situations, um, I spoke to journalists that were not protected, I would say, by their media companies, um, not just working in the conflict areas, not just going um, um, and reporting from the war zones, uh, but also uh, journalists, particularly female journalists, working online. Um, abuse uh, online, um, um, death threats, rape threats. Um, they would go to their company, they would not have an answer from them. They would go to police, they would not have an answer from, from, from them. Uh, and then they would go underground. Many close their Facebook accounts, um, um, Twitter accounts, and stop performing journalism any longer. So media companies, they, they need to make sure, they need to work uh, with police uh, when it comes to these problems. Uh, they need to uh, work with psychologists as well. Uh, they need to work for media with media associations in order to make sure that the journalists that are providing audience uh, with these factual investigative stories are the ones that are also protected by those media companies. There is a need for more plurality. Uh, speech uh, that is calling um, for violence, um, speech that is used, words that are used in order to call for killing people, uh, is not part of free expression uh, debate at all. Um, and that is something that we need to find a way to fight by introducing certain laws, by giving this uh, task to uh, intermediaries uh, is not 
uh, a way to solve this problem. Speech that we find offensive, vulgar, um, uh, inappropriate uh, is part of freedom of speech and that is actually the price we have to pay for living in democracy. Uh, it seems to me that now in 21st century we are more sensitive than ever before. The internet is a is a huge place full of stuff that we might not necessarily want to engage with and might not necessarily want to read about. The, the debate about the echo chamber is, is an interesting one. Um, it's always described as a negative, that we are blinkering ourselves or being blinkered by technology um, in the, and as a result becoming you know, more ideologically polarised and, and limited in the way that we understand the world and form our views and all the rest of it. Try following 20 people who you really disagree with on, on a social media platform and the rate at which you come into contact with their views and the views that they share in with you from other people. In many ways we'd encourage people to, to break out of their echo chamber but you'll be exhausted by the end of it. I found it really, really difficult. We can't have the best of both worlds. We can't use the internet in a way that is that is family friendly or whatever it might be and at the same time expect to come into contact with the views of people who we strongly disagree with. There is also a popular sentiment that content uh, recommended algorithms are making us more polarized and segregate. But do they? For decades we've been choosing which political paper to read. We've been surrounding ourselves with people with similar uh, or the same opinion that we have. Uh, but right now the difference is that we are also having this kind of behavior online mainly on social media. We're hearing a lot of talk at the moment about the idea of filter bubbles and echo chambers. The idea being that when people are on social media, um, they choose for themselves an environment where they only receive a certain sort of news, news from a certain ideological position. And also that the platforms themselves target um, political news to individual users to kind of keep them happy, to not present them with something too far away from their ideological space. Um, and the argument goes that therefore we receive, those people who receive their news from social media exist in some sort of daily me type environment where they're just hearing um, what they want to hear. In my view, there's a few things that are wrong with that argument. Um, first of all, people have always chosen to be with people who are like them, the phenomenon of birds of a feather flocking together. Um, we tend to choose places to entertain ourselves where there are people like us. We even tend to kind of rent or buy houses in areas where there are people like us. Um, and that's a very, very long-standing ph phenomenon. We're really good at creating echo chambers in the offline world. Um, so it's not at all surprising that we might do so on the online world, um, but it is debatable whether there are any, any worse or, 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 or better um, than the ones we choose in offline spaces. Um, that's one important point um, uh, to make. But all the evidence is really beginning to point to the fact that pe people in general are not in echo chambers in social media. There's research showing that um, uh, people who use social media tend to see more news sources than people who don't use social media. Um, and uh, there's starting to be a range of evidence that suggests that um, echo chambers are, the phenomenon of echo chambers is very much exaggerated. When you're thinking about things like um, fake news and echo chambers, as I, as I said before, and even hate and incitement to hatred, you could point your finger at some traditional media companies. The discussion about propaganda and the way propaganda uh, can influence uh, negative uh, events, uh, even wars, uh, in certain society is part of, of a different debate um, and part of, of so-called um, information wars. Um, but simple lies, um, not call it simple, but just lies uh, uh, by certain uh, media uh, uh, is something that society should be dealing with themselves. Social media companies, social media platforms, they're institutions in our political landscape. It's not surprising that 
Um, in terms of regulating or, or, or controlling what they do or introducing kind of norms or guidelines for what they do, it's not surprising that that institutional catch-up um, is still somewhat um, behind. Um, social media platforms have only been around for 10 years and they've only been intertwined with politics for about five. If Facebook and Twitter can find a way to make their users feel proud to be part of this huge community, um, to take responsibility for it, so moderating the content, keeping track of it, encouraging people, giving people power to moderate the content, whether governments would accept that as, as a possible solution to what's bad on platform, I don't think so, and I'm not so sure, but... Uh, uh, I think in general we are failing when it comes to internet literacy. We have to remember that you know, young people are on the internet now before they're in the playground. The internet is a very difficult place to learn about the world. It seems like there's everything there, but actually it's, it's, it, takes a real, it takes a lot of skill to be able to navigate the internet and, and, and try to make sense of all of this. We need to build up this, this skill set to be able to distinguish what is good content and truthful content, not get mugged off and not be lied to for money. Learning doesn't only happen through watching a documentary or the news show. It might not be immediately obvious, but uh, a diverse cast in our favorite TV show or a fair representation of minorities also play a greater role in our awareness and how we see the world. That's what responsible media is about. It is content owners and distributors engaging with communities and providing entertainment that is relevant, appropriate and balanced.